Thanks everyone for joining us. Welcome to APC's final webinar on this Road to COP26 series that we've been running since mid-September, mid -September, in fact. Um, I'm Bhavik Shah, your host for today's session from the APC. Um, we've, we've had quite a bit of a journey on this uh, and the Road to COP26 is, 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 is uh, quite fitting to say uh, as, a, as, a, um, as a journey, how, how a journey would pan out. We've been able to cover topics on this series like digitalization, batteries, power electronics, e-machines, electric motors, we've covered investments, and even energy. So we've recovered so much. And this is all for that transition to net zero, getting our industrial economy ready for a new phase in climate change. Well, today we bring you the role of fuel cells, uh, that crucial technology in decarbonizing transport. There is a, a set of experts in our panel, in our panel, um, amazing diversity, as well as the depth of what we can do within fuel cells. So you're in for a real treat. Um, just before we do that, we'll go through some housekeeping items. So uh, firstly, you should know that today's session is being recorded. It's a live session being recorded, and we will be sending you notification when that recording is available for you to share within your organizations and to share widely so that we can socialize this topic. Uh, during today, we will have two parts of interactions from your side. One is in the, in the questions. We will have the Q&A section. You, those who are veterans within Zoom will know there's uh, the buttons at the bottom. There's one that's got Q&A on it, and that's the one where we would like ask you to post your questions. The other uh, button on chat is the one where you can interact with other participants. You'll have uh, mediators from the APC there available as well to, to talk to or, or to ask for help. And finally, when we finish the call today, we, we really welcome the chance to get your feedback on how things have been. We take this information um, yeah, to, to good use, uh, you'll be uh, pleased to know, and we can then make improvements as needed. So thank you again, uh, really great that you're able to join us today for this very crucial debate on fuel cell technology, uh, particularly um, giving us a UK angle towards it as well. Right, so we have, as I was saying, a jam-packed agenda for you. We're going to start, and, and you're in for a real treat, um, absolute experts in their field. We'll start with a keynote from uh, Joanna uh, Richard. Uh, as, head of, um, as, as head of Hydrogen Ricardo, you'll have a, a wealth, uh, you'll have a wealth of diversity and information from, uh, from her in the start. Then we move on to six five-minute presentations from our panelists, these are going to be jam-packed with um, with experts uh, in the, in, and leaders in their fields, sharing with the, with you their insights. Covering covering people, from, uh, we're covering NPL here. We're covering Johnson Mathe, E4 Tech, Intelligent Energy, Teva, and from the APC, uh, Luke Bates will be launching brand new value chain um, maps on fuel cells and hydrogen tanks as well today. So uh, to get us started, let me begin with, in fact, a quote from IEA's recent Global Hydrogen Review. So uh, International Energy Agency's int recent Global Hydrogen Review 2021 released just earlier this month, 4th of October. Here's the quote. After several false starts, a new beginning is around the corner. The time is ripe to tap into hydrogen's potential contribution to sustainable energy systems. Wow, so this is, this is from an agency that's been doing this for years and has been reviewing this status for a while and has made that statement. Now, why this has, why is this and what are the key facts based, that's, that this is being based on? The costs of automotive fuel cells has fallen by 70% since 2008, right? The Mirai currently, the first generation one had $1,100 of platinum content. Gen 2 has $500 of platinum content right, straight away. There are more than 8,000 fuel cell vehicles sold in the first half of 2021 worldwide. With the record sales in California in March, 759 vehicles in, in, uh, in California, and obviously Korea, 1,265 in April. So we are looking at 43,000 fuel cell vehicles worldwide as a pool at the moment. Of course, California is leading uh, quite a bit of, that, uh, bit of that journey. The fuel cell partnership, industry, the government there working together is looking at an ambition of 1 million fuel cell electric vehicles by 2030 and 1,000 hydrogen refueling stations by 2030 as well. So there is a lot there. 
Then Hyundai come along and wow us with their 2040 hydrogen strategy, which they did uh, recently as well. A bold vision launching a new wave of hydrogen vehicles across multiple sectors and segments over the next two decades with price parity with BEV expected by 2030 in their view as well. Uh, this, is, this is quite an interesting time. So today um, we're going to explore and debate exactly this point, how fuel cell technology is here and here to stay. And I welcome uh, some amazing uh, information from our presenters today to help us and guide us through that process. So on that, I will hand over to Joanna to kick us off with the keynote. So thank you, Shaq, very much for this uh, lovely introduction and uh, for having Ricardo opening this very interesting session. Uh, indeed, fuel cells uh, play a very key role in our uh, road to decarbonization and achieving net zero is indeed a very ambitious target. And uh, some of the numbers you have mentioned there, uh, we will probably see a similar picture in the coming slides. So let me uh, start. Hopefully, this will also be moving when I start pressing send. So on this slide, I'm sharing a little bit from the Ricardo Visions, where we position ourselves as a company, which is here, ready, fit for the future. However, how that future look like is constantly evolving. We see so many different initiatives around the world and so many activities that needs to happen for the world to become uh, the net uh, zero globally. Uh, in order to achieve that, we cannot focus all the time at all the things, but there is so much that influences it. So today I will just focus on the net zero energy and a decarbonized transport. I have deliberately pointed these two out a little separately because even in the industry, on the EU level, we're starting to see very much the debate happening between the production of the hydrogen and let's say fuel cell vehicles. We're starting to see people saying, you should make the targets based on well to tank and then tank to wheel. So everyone is responsible for, for what they can influence. So you can already see that the, the world is a little bit trying to achieve the targets where they can and take that responsibility, it is clearly going to be very challenging because every market sector is slightly different. Every industry is changing slightly different challenging. Geographies are playing very important roles and governments, very, very important role. They setting the, the vision and the target which is very good because activities uh, like the Paris Agreement and net zero targets, it's all driving that common goal. So all the markets, be it moving in slightly different speeds, are moving towards that common goal. I have used uh, this slide from World Energy Council. It's a little bit overwhelming, but it just shows some of the global activities which are happening in the hydrogen. Uh, this is a summary published in May 2021. That's why you don't see UK uh, on the line yet, but I'm sure many of the panelists as we go along through the day will mention uh, where the UK hydrogen strategy is, and we are very pleased it's now live. Uh, however, this uh, slide gives us that global overview of activities that are happening. And also it points things that matter. So if we analyze it, what is it we are looking at? So people looking whether these global strategies have direct investments. It is clear that without those direct interventions, it will be very difficult for the market to happen. So very important aspect to make sure it's included in the hydrogen strategies. The second line I outlined there is the legislative and regulatory measure. Very often the market always find some key players who want to lead the way and they are ahead of the regulation. And it's amazing to have such players and we have seen lots of them in the hydrogen and fuel cell segment. But there will always be those who are maybe not having so much finances or for whatever, for whatever reasons, they kind of cannot lead the way. Not everybody can be the leader. And they wait, wait, wait until it is the legislative requirement that they have to do something. So it is very important that legislation is coming alone for hydrogen across so many countries. 
The next line I outlined there is the standardization. And we have seen it with electric vehicles. I don't know, uh, most of you will remember the early days about six different standards for the plug-in. It's really good to see that hydrogen industry managed to have those debates quite early on and standardize on the sort of nozzle, the refueling pressures, and all that is very important. And on the station size and those safety aspects that coming with it, and I'm sure some of our panelists can then expand on these areas of different standards and legislations as we go along. And the uh, last line I would like to point out is still the investment coming into research and development. We have seen lots of solutions happening. There are real life applications already happening, but still we need to continue supporting the development in order to reduce costs, uh, bring more commercial volumes, and indeed enable uh, further players to enter the market to increase better competition. So I have just done a little calculations and you can see there is a lot more still going for the research and development than is uh, going to the other areas, which in my uh, own perspective, it's very good because I believe that market still needs more players to come in. We have seen a big uptake and the competition is definitely driving progress and driving innovation. So uh, more development needed and it will be very good for the industry. Uh, the next line I outline on this uh, strategy overview is several different terminologies which are outlining what kind of hydrogen we will be using in 2030 and 2050. And you can see there is a mix of green, renewable, low carbon, eco-friendly. Wow. Uh, and uh, I would like to point out what you all probably know uh, the UK is paving the way with uh, its consultation for the low carbon hydrogen uh, standards. And as we can see clearly, it is very much needed because there is so many different possibilities of producing hydrogen, measuring that carbon content. And it will be very good when UK is leading the way in setting the standards for the low carbon. So I'm very pleased uh, about that. And the last area is this overview of different transport uh, segments which are included. So we can just look and see very clearly that the darkest colors are in the segment for the medium and heavy duty uh, applications and buses. So it's clear, it reflects what we are seeing already in the world. There is so many initiatives pushing ahead with lots of trucks on the road, US about 70,000 plants, China putting trucks and buses and lots of initiatives around Europe. And indeed in UK, we now have ton, tens and tens of buses driving in the real cities every day, which is very amazing. So how do we see that whole market? Are we still going to meet the targets? Are we not? Uh, I have just recently heard uh, that even if you summarize all the global, so all the countries that signed the Paris Agreement, if we put all their most ambitious plans together, we will still only reach 40% of the 2050 target. So clearly we still have a long way to go. And we make big forecasts, but then lots of things happening that we spoke about, the environments are constantly changing. So you see uh, here FCHJU has provided these uh, updates uh, some time ago uh, and clearly the numbers are getting, for example, for the passenger cars a little bit slower. Why is that? Well, A, the infrastructure is not everywhere. We keep talking about it, but that consumer perspective, even if they have a one station around, they will still not go ahead and buy that car until they have at least two or three stations, having that comfort factor that if one is down, I can still refill. It's very important for the consumers. So I believe it's that fear factor that possibly slow down uh, and COVID and everything there else a little bit, these sort of forecasted volumes. Where we have seen a really good uptake is in those applications highlighted here, and I call it the, the cluster uh, environments. So that enables the users to match the supply and demand 
because like buses, everybody knows this is the depot. It has this many buses every day. They go such a such distance. So we can see very nicely how much hydrogen we will be needing. Same goes actually a little bit for the lorry drivers. We see that cluster is now becoming also the main motorways, main highways, lots of initiatives in US. The Fit 455 is suggesting that every 150 kilometers, they should be refueling station gaseous, every 400 kilometers, even liquid hydrogen. So we can see again, a corridor, a road, 10T network becoming a cluster. Forklifts, very easy cluster. That's why we see so much demand because there's so many of them in one warehouse. And then I would cluster the trains a little bit as well because they also have that predictable route, predictable demand. And they very often come to the same hubs uh, where there might be other modes of transport so they can be part of that complex uh, application solutions. However, trains and marines I see coming still a little bit later. Why? Because those demands, the energy they need to perform those challenging duty cycles are still challenging. And hence, it's very good we still see investment in R&D and in development because these technologies can also be decarbonized using hydrogen, using fuel cells. But we perhaps have a little bit uh, more work to do as an industry before we can really see this globally applied. So the last aspect we haven't mentioned is the whole life cycle assessment. And it's now becoming more and more a topic. It's no longer just say, can I make a zero emission car? But it's all, how do I make it? How do I get the fuel? Where do I get the fuel from? Looking at that whole life cycle assessment. And it's becoming more and more important to have good methodologies, which can compare all the different possibly the roadmaps, platforms, and then assess which ones are most viable for each region. This is just an example of an LC assessment. It was commissioned by DG Klima. Ricardo was very honored that we uh, were tasked to do uh, such an important uh, piece of work for the industry. And even if here I am showing some charts, the purpose of the report was to create a consistent methodology how to measure LCA. So these are just examples. If applied, this is how it could look like. What we see there is that most of uh, the applications by 2050, the red line in the middle, which is the least impact, comes from fuel cells. So in my mind, that just means the fuel cells certainly have a role, even when looking at them from the whole life cycle assessment point of view. And it's very encouraging. So industry, if uh, we look at the challenges they still have uh, to face, so we just address the life cycle impact. And uh, clearly there is lots of energy losses from getting that energies from the ground, from the air, from the sea, wherever it comes from, all the way to the wheel. So we need to try to reduce those losses and that's an industry challenge. The other challenge we are now seeing is happening quite a lot is implementing at larger scale uh, carbon capture solutions, which will uh, go hand in hand with the UK hydrogen strategy for the blue hydrogen. So cost, I think, uh, Shah, you mentioned very nicely that we have seen the rapid uh, cost reductions in the last year. And I definitely echo that we have seen the cost reductions. We have seen cost reduction on electrolyzer prices as well. I just challenge a little bit that sort of levelized cost of hydrogen versus the strike price. It always depends where you are, whether you will get access to that levelized hydrogen price. So it very much depends uh, where, where you are because the transport is very important part of the end cost. And infrastructure is clearly still being talked about because it still needs a, a lot of development. I dare to put some numbers. They keep changing all the time. It's very encouraging that the new stations are being built globally, more and more governments coming. And it's really lovely to now start seeing some uh, even Far East countries, the smaller economies, and they are starting to have their first station while the more uh, leaders already have near 100 stations in one country. So 
big differences globally again, but pushing to that common goal, it, it's very encouraging. We still have some work to do on the safety and regulations as we discussed. And uh, we starting to see that sort of global idea that actually going local and find cluster industrial zones uh, might be the right answer for helping with that infrastructure challenge. So still lots to do, but if industry works together, finds a way to work together, uh, we will certainly be able to find a way. So on one hand, uh, we have lots of the uh, green hydrogen initiatives, blue hydrogen initiatives. And if we look at the uh, initial maps, we start seeing the clusters. And on the other hand, we do see lots of the clusters happening in the sort of technology uptake. Uh, the T side while is happening, uh, Ricardo is supplying there the retrofit bus, and there are other applications coming around the same cluster. So it's been really good that announcement the UK government has done. More clusters hopefully will be coming shortly. We see lots of initiatives around UK, the Orkney, Dundee, Five you name it, so many clusters are now finding their own little uh, hydrogen strategy and trying to find solution. Why is it that still so challenging? Well, because uh, the infrastructure lead times are long, for sure, uh, whether you choose electrolyzer or a carbon capture solution, it still will be a year, two years before all the permissions are done, all the piping set. Uh, the production prices uh, are also going to be changing and trying to blend all that green hydrogen in uh, will be a little challenging as well because wind doesn't always blow, uh, the sun doesn't always shine and it's not just that, it's arranging it with the timeline and on the other side we have the application. So many modes of transport should happen at the same time. Do we actually have the end user acceptance? Because yes, we now know passenger cars are happening, buses are happening, passengers are quite happy to ride on the passenger buses. Uh, is the same acceptance going to the port material handling applications? And all that phasing in, phasing out, seasonalities, all that is playing incredibly important role when trying to balance both sides of that supply and demand. And that's just local. And now let's step back and do it globally. Ricardo has done currently studies for over 20 ports across 13 countries. And even if they looked a little bit similar, the answers every time were very different. So this is where we're starting to see now countries starting to trade on hydrogen. There is lots of export, imports, new partnerships being created and trying to mix and balance all that hydrogen demand and supply globally is certainly an ongoing challenge. So to conclude, and I am happy for our panelists to either agree or disagree, uh, I believe hydrogen is globally recognized as an energy vector and the governments and industry are making the right investment and everything is moving ahead in a nice pace. So fuel cells hopefully will be widely adopted we can see the product cost uh, uh, dropping, which is again, very, very encouraging. Timing of the market is however, still dependent on the maturity of the supply, the distribution, the infrastructure, uh, uh, the, the cross-border collaboration. So it could uh, happen, but we still need to make sure the investment happens along the pathway. Governments, we already mentioned, very important. We know they are supporting fuel cells, uh, whether it's PEM, solid oxide fuel cell, alternative fuels, it's all happening and the government support is important. And it's really nice to see that the voice is there out for fuel cells. Last but not least, I believe fuel cells can prove that they have a viable technology solution and a roadmap for multiple uh, transport solution. So I hope to see fuel cells and hydrogen in every transport application in the future. And on that, I hand over back to you, Shah. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. That was perfect. So um, I just love the diversity you've brought out. The cluster demand methodology was, was, was brilliantly um, articulated. Um, you also brought out the consumer infrastructure dynamic that's happening, the challenges for us in R&D to overcome. 
and that international landscape. Uh, Joanna, thank you. That was excellent. We're now walking into uh, six presentations of five minutes each. We'll start off with yourself, Gareth. Great. Uh, thanks, Bavik. So hi, everyone. I'm Gareth Hines, Science Area Leader of the Electrochemistry Group at NPL. We're the UK's National Measurement Institute, and we're concerned with all things to do with measurement, testing, and standardization. So we don't make any fuel cells, we don't make electrolyzers or lithium ion batteries, but we work on the measurement techniques, the modeling tools and the standard test methods that enable innovation and fast fail in these areas. So we're working very closely with academia and with industry to accelerate the green recovery and to achieve net zero by 2050. So there are a lot of things I could have talked about today. Um, I'm not actually going to talk about fuel cells because the deployment of fuel cells depends critically on the availability of green hydrogen, um, particularly in the longer term. We've seen the UK's hydrogen strategy that we're pursuing both blue hydrogen and green hydrogen with the infrastructure around blue hydrogen providing a framework for longer term uptake of electrolysis to produce green hydrogen. And I thought I'd just share um, a recent breakthrough we've made at NPL where it demonstrates the role of measurement and testing in accelerating innovation. So I'm going to talk about polymer electrolyte membrane water electrolyzers, and hopefully you will be able to see this video. Apologies if it's a little bit jerky over uh, Zoom. Um, but just to demonstrate how it works, you have two electrodes, a cathode and an anode, with a membrane in between them. Water is oxidized at the anode to produce oxygen. The protons that are produced then transfer through the membrane to the cathode where green hydrogen is produced. And this can be stored for use in a range of hydrogen applications. The structure of a polymer electrolyte membrane water electrolyzer looks like this. You have your anode catalyst layer and your cathode catalyst layer on each side of the polymer electrolyte membrane. You have a porous transport layer and a bipolar plate, which are typically made out of platinum coated titanium a very expensive material. And this shows a breakdown of the typical cost of a polymer electrolyte membrane water electrolyzer stack, showing that the bipolar plate and the porous transport layer together make up around 43% of the cost of the stack. And this actually can be as much as 70% in other designs of water electrolyzer stacks. And the main reason for this high cost, as I mentioned, is the platinum coated titanium that's often used. The reason it's used is there's a perception that the anode environment uh, with its high potential of about two volts leads to a greater risk of corrosion and a very corrosion resistant material like platinum and titanium is often used in these designs. So the question was, can we make this technology cheaper by substituting the titanium with cheaper materials, for example, carbon or stainless steel? And we carried out some measurements at NPL to demonstrate the potential at the current collector. So equivalent to the bipolar plate in an operating water electrolyzer. So we used this single cell design. I'm not gonna to go too much into the details, but the key was using an external reference electrode to measure the local potential at the current collector. And what we showed for the first time with these groundbreaking measurements was that the assumption in the industry that the potential of the current collector would sit very close to the anode or uh, the cell voltage uh, was actually not true. And it sits completely independent at its local potential, which is only determined by the local electrochemistry and chemistry of the deionized water. And the reason for this decoupling in potential is the very low conductivity of the deionized water that's used uh, in, as feed water in these water electrolyzer systems. So this is a really important observation, and it leads to uh, a, a new concept in the design of these devices that actually you don't need platinum coated titanium for the bulk of the material of the bipolar plate and the porous transport layer. You can replace all of this material with carbon coated stainless steel. And we've already carried out 30 day tests on this new material, showing that it's completely fit for purpose. There's absolutely no degradation. And all the indications are that this concept is viable. The only trick to implement it will be, of course, that you need a very thin porous layer of platinum coated titanium, like a micro porous layer, in between the porous transport layer and the anode catalyst layer. But this will significantly reduce the material cost and therefore the capex cost of water electrolyzers. 
So to summarize, because of this decoupling that we've measured at NPL and demonstrated in initial tests, we can use much lower cost materials and we could reduce the stack cost by up to 70%, which will accelerate deployment of hydrogen technologies. Apologies for the technical glitches, but uh, hopefully the rest of the presentation was visible. And back to you, Babak. It definitely was, Gareth. Thank you. So there you go. Uh, a depth of research, a depth of innovation, all UK led. And uh, thank you uh, for the NPL, the work you're doing at NPL, Gareth. Next is Andy Walker from Johnson Matthew. Andy, looking forward to this very much. Um, you guys play a role in sustainable technologies for, for decades, uh, plus in batteries and fuel cells. Over to you. Thanks very much, Mavic, and, uh, and hello, everyone. I'm Andy Walker. I'm the Technical Marketing Director of Johnson Matthew. And JM is a global organization, perhaps best known for car exhaust catalysts, um, so cleaning the air that way. We're also doing a lot of work in battery materials for battery electric vehicles. We've been working in the fuel cells area for many, many years. In fact, when William Grove, in, Grove invented the fuel cell back in the mid 1800s, he used platinum that was supplied by Johnson Matthey. So we really have been in fuel cells right from the, uh, the, the very beginning. So what I'm going to be doing today is looking a bit at the overall ecosystem and the way that we see net zero transport emissions being, uh, being brought about. So quick reminder of what's going on, we do need significant progress to reach one and a half degree C emission trajectory, which is the target of the IPCC and obviously the target of the upcoming COP26 meeting. And as Joanna said, even with some of the optimistic net zero targets, we're coming in somewhere between two and two and a half degrees at the moment. And I think this chart really shows the importance of getting on with stuff today. So here we've really to get on this 1.5 degree C path, greenhouse gas emissions need to fall by around 45% over the next 10 years. So we, we can't just wait for new innovations to come on. We've got to start deploying what we've got while the new innovations come through and learn, learn by doing. The other key thing is that really the two early movers here in terms of enabling us to reduce greenhouse gases are going to be transport, where we're already starting to see significant electrification, particularly in the passenger car space, and power generation, where we're starting to see, where we're seeing the cost of renewables coming down, and we're really starting to see that take off, not so much for policy reasons necessarily, more for economic reasons. And I think this coupling is very important. Um, we need the decarbonisation of all sectors to go simultaneously to enable us to hit the net zero targets over the course of the next 30 years or so. There's no point in driving a battery electric vehicle if the electricity, for example, is being provided from a coal fired power plant. So making sure that we get the decarbonisation of these sectors in sync is really important. But transport is really going to be one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the leading edge. I think as we look at this, you know, the, the, the topic here is fuel cells. Fuel cells are going to play a major role in decarbonizing transport, but it's not going to be the sole approach. And I think the, the key thing with net zero, is, as, as we've shown, is that it's extremely challenging. It's not about blue hydrogen versus green hydrogen. It's not about battery electric vehicles versus fuel cell electric vehicles. We're going to need everything that we can, everything that we've got at our disposal in order to hit these targets. And so oftentimes, if you can take a renewable electron and use it directly, for example, in a small urban passenger car, then that's going to be the most efficient and most cost effective way of doing things. We also look at this direct use of electricity for heating homes and businesses, a major part of that. Most rail applications, particularly long distance rail transport and things like that. But there are going to be a number of cases where that direct use of the renewable electron isn't the best way forward. And a number of them are shown here, for example, aviation is a fairly obvious one where the battery electric uh, energy density isn't going to be high enough to enable, for example, transatlantic flights anytime soon that are battery powered. And I think as we look at ground transportation, this is where we really see larger long range light duty transport. So there will be a proportion of the passenger car fleet which transitions to, to fuel cells over time. But perhaps one of the main ones is going to be in the heavy duty transport where we're moving things long distances by truck, moving freight um, and other goods by, by truck. And in the commercial vehicle space, decisions are made based on total cost of ownership. So you look at, yes, the cost of the, of the vehicle is important, but the overall cost of running it when it comes to things like particularly the fuel in this case. So as we look at the, the, the cost of ownership projections going forward, we can see in this work by, by McKinsey, over time, 
the fuel cell in the long haul trucking space becomes the lowest total cost of ownership option. And because in the commercial vehicle space, it's all about TCO. These are, these are um, business assets. You really need to, uh, to be focusing on the lowest TCO um, option when you're looking to renew your fleet. There is a lot of talk about battery electric long haul trucks and battery electric trucks will play a role, for example, in medium duty and buses and things like that, supplemented by fuel cells for some of the longer distance and some of the, some of the more challenging ones. But when you look at long haul trucks, the challenges with the battery electric approach are in order to get the kind of range that you need, you need a big battery. The big battery is going to be expensive, so that's going to hit your total cost of ownership. It's going to be heavy, potentially impacting the payload that you can carry. And again, if you're in a business, the payload that you can carry is a critical part of your business proposition. And it's going to impact the charging time. So the charging time is going to be longer than, for example, the, the refueling time if we're using hydrogen. So again, you're, you're curtailing the use of your, of your asset. And what we're starting to see is significant investments in the, the fuel cell space within this heavy commercial vehicle sector from people like Cummins, Wei Chai, Daimler, Volvo and others. And what we're seeing as a final slide here, this is um, Volvo's target from their uh, Capital Markets Day last year, looking at as they go forward in the commercial vehicle space, they see significant role for battery electric, mainly in the medium duty applications, fuel cell electric in the long haul. So we expect to see significant uptake of fuel cell in long haul trucks. And, uh, and David, the next speaker, will be picking up on this. But first of all, back to you, Barbic. Thank you, Andy. Um, again, it helps us understand how batteries and fuel cells work with an industry towards decarbonisation and the variety of ways applications could work. So thank you. Now over to David Hart from E4 Tech. Of course, David spent 25 years within hydrogen. He understands the international spectrum better than most in the UK. And I'm really delighted that we'll have a rich understanding of what's happening globally. Over to you, David. Thank you very much, Barvik. And thank you to the previous speakers for, for teeing this up so brilliantly. Uh, as Barvik says, I'm going to give a, a slightly international flavour to this. Uh, obviously, very close links with the UK still, but I'm actually based in Switzerland. And I'm going to talk specifically about Switzerland in a minute. So what I wanted to do was just give you one slide on E4Tech because there have been some changes since probably some of you uh, last were, were spoken to by any of us. And then I'm going to just give that overview. So E4Tech, as many of you will know, we've been around for 20 odd years. Uh, we've always been something of a boutique consultancy, very much focused on the energy transition, the sustainable energy space, of which I cover everything that is fuel cells and hydrogen. Since the market, as Joanna pointed out uh, very graphically, is growing fast and uh, there is enormous interest globally, um, we took the decision this year to become part of a bigger organisation, uh, ERM, Environmental Resources Management, where we have uh, more firepower, more, more reach uh, and more colleagues to, to work with, which is very, very exciting. But otherwise, nothing changes. We remain the same people and, and we look forward to continuing all of the interesting discussions that we all have. The only other thing I wanted to point out from this slide is our fuel cell industry review. I'm going to be using some data from that in a minute. Uh, that's something we do every year. We're starting the process for the latest one uh, right now. Uh, if you feel you ought to be involved, uh, you have some data to share or you have some perspectives, please do get in touch. Otherwise, we plan for it to come out early next year. And here are the data I mentioned. And I think what I really wanted to pull out of the next couple of slides and out of this presentation are, are two or three things. One is that when we track the data and when we parse the data, we do it in different ways. And on the top right, you see megawatts shipped of fuel cells by application. And portable, very small fuel cells, very small contributor, stationary power, large fuel cells, but relatively fewer of them, and transport. You can see that's the biggest contributor to deployed megawatts of fuel cells globally. And that's really important because that speaks to the cost question that Andy mentioned, that Joanna mentioned, and of course also um, is, is relevant that Gareth mentioned on the electrolyzer side. But it's, that's because the more you build, the cheaper it gets. Very simple. So transport is a really important cost driver and we need to play that into what we think about the long-term future. The other thing I wanted to bring out here was the fact that actually Europe and, and 
that includes the UK, um, is not very well uh, ahead in terms of deployments. So uh, you'll see that Asia has by far the most deployments of fuel cells. North America has a reasonable number. We've heard about California. That's because of strong policy. Europe has very strong industry, very strong supporting credentials, very strong supply chain, but less in terms of deployment support. And that was one of the things I wanted to come back to, which is uh, Joanna mentioned the importance of R&D and uh, Andy mentioned the importance of speed and the possibility of getting TCO equivalents in 2027, 28 for some applications. But we also need to think about carrots and sticks. And what's happened up until now has mostly been carrots. So the support that's in Asia, in North America, that's led to this rollout has been subsidies and tax breaks and things like that. But what we're going to start to see is sticks. And that is particularly important for what comes next. So one other thing to mention here, a lot of the transport uh, numbers that are rolled out year on year are actually forklifts. That is a business proposition, which is not only a cluster, which is helpful, but is also a coherent business model. By using a forklift, interestingly, often instead of a battery forklift, you put a fuel cell in, you actually get a return on investment, a positive return on investment. That's why people do it. So there is an element of air quality, CO2, but a battery forklift gives you that anyway. What you're doing here is making a point for the CEO that you can save them money. And what I wanted to come to next is a little bit on infrastructure rollout. These are snapshots taken from different uh, tracking mechanisms in and outside of country. And they give us an idea of what's happening because this speaks to that infrastructure question globally. And there are two points I want to bring out. One is there are quite a lot of refueling stations being built, uh, which is a great thing. Uh, the other is that the impact of these fueling stations has been quite different in different regions. So in Germany, there are close to 100 fueling stations which are in operation or in build, but very few cars. Uh, in Japan, it's about the same picture. Uh, in Korea, however, you have slightly fewer fueling stations, but you have a lot of cars. And that's because the Korean government has been driving uptake, has been driving demand, as well as driving the supply side. And those things need to come together. So the point about having infrastructure and therefore enabling vehicles is important, but you do need to push on both sides of the equation. And the final slide I have illustrates an unusual situation, which is related to the sticks that I mentioned earlier. So, if we look at the 2030 period, what will happen in Europe in particular is that there will be very strong CO2 penalties on heavy duty vehicles, just as there are for light duty vehicles already, which is one of the things that's driven battery electric vehicle uptake. It's the threat of being fined out of existence. And so the total cost of ownership at some point needs to include those sticks that will come in. And in Switzerland, there's a very unusual situation in that there was already legislation in place. There's a heavy vehicle charge, which is related to all trucking. And there is a mineral oil tax, which is effectively a fossil fuel tax, but is directly related to CO2. And by combining those, you can reduce your costs by over 100,000 francs per truck per year. So it turns out that Switzerland is a great place to start building truck operations. And that's exactly what's happened. So there is a consortium which has been put together, which has Hyundai trucks, which has the co-op and Nespresso and a whole range of other suppliers looking to put 1600 trucks in place because it's cost effective. And a thought to finish with is we need to do this now, as everybody has said. We need to do R&D as well. But I think if you asked Hyundai and said, is your truck perfect? Do you have durability data for the 50,000 hours you need? Are you certain this is the final answer? They would have said no. But they said, this is an opportunity. We need to get it moving. We will learn from this. We can fill in with R&D as it goes forward. And that's really important. We need to be learning by doing as well as by learning by all of the fantastic analysis that's going on in other places. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions.
Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, so the, the thing you bring out, that risk um, methodology around how we decarbonize with a variety of tools in our toolbox, making sure that we get the right incentives and in, uh, incentivization and carrot and stick approach is, is, is crucial. I like the uh, infrastructure scale up that's happening, which we will hopefully talk about in the Q&A um, as well a little bit more. So just because of a uh, slight, so we're slightly running short on time. Um, the next topic will be, how do we make these fuel cells? So who other than Intelligent Energy? So Greg Harris from Intelligent Energy is with us. Greg, welcome. Looking forward right. <laughs> to uh, knowing how we build these things. Good day, everyone. Um, thank you, Barrett, for the introduction. So um, very briefly, just uh, talk about Intelligent Energy. So uh, we are the UK's only manufacturer of PEM fuel cells. Um, we've been uh, around as business for 20 years with 10 years before that of uh, development going on at Loughborough University. Um, and we'll talk today a bit about how uh, we're seeing the uptake of fuel cells and how they can play their role in net zero and decarbonisation. So firstly, um, you know, looking at how fuel cells can support these net zero targets. I won't dwell on this too long because, um, you know, it's been touched on by my uh, colleagues on the call today. Um, but essentially, you know, um, what we've seen recently is this um, understanding um, coming through that um, the battery technology, whilst it provides the zero emissions uh, capability that people are looking for, it, it does have a number of drawbacks, which I think are, are, are well recognised. Um, the, the, the simple fact that to get long range, you need a huge, you need a huge heavy battery. Um, trying to meet flexible duty cycles and long operating periods is really challenging. Um, there's the questions around sustainability, and it's interesting what. Joanna said about the life cycle analysis on fuel cells, which reflects our, our, our understanding as well. Um, and, and the ability to kind of um, go through this modularity approach with fuel cells um, and scaling the power output to reach a wide range of motive applications. But what we also see, um, and I'll talk a bit more on the next slide, is, is, the, is the demand from other industries as well, um, and that market developing significantly um, um, already. So in terms of the, 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 the products that Intelligent Energy has developed, um, um, yeah, as, as Joanna touched on, it's, you know, the, the, the uptake in the automotive world has been slower than some predicted, faster than others, depending on your perspective. Um, but um, as a business, we spent a lot of time focusing on some of the other opportunities and developing fuel cells for, um, for applications where they are cluster-based applications, um, getting around the issues of infrastructure. And for example, with the, um, with the drones, we actually work with partners to supply um, small electrolyzers so they can be completely um, you know, um, or, or independent if need be, or, or hydrogen tanks as, as required. Um, the lift product is really, um, we're seeing a lot of demand now, particularly from areas like material handling and welfare cabins and other areas where customers are looking to improve their, um, their decarbonisation activities, even if that's not their mainstream industry. For example, um, we recently received an order for 100 fuel cells for a German um, automotive OEM to use in their warehouses because um, that's a way that they can reduce their carbon footprint. And for the same reasons, as David said, seeing the benefits um, from a flexibility, but also from a, a um, ROI perspective over using battery um, powered forklifts in their warehouses. And then onto IE Drive, which is our um, uh, sort of flagship product now, which is, um, which we're, we're starting to build the first units now, which um, will go into a range of automotive applications um, and uh, particularly targeted at buses and trucks, um, again, where there can be some level of cluster-based approach and it's not reliant necessarily on such a, a, a distributed infrastructure. Um, I also want to talk a bit about how, um, you know, um, investment, and collaboration has helped us to accelerate accelerate our innovation at Intelligent Energy. We, you know, we've been very uh, fortunate to be able to access some of the fantastic funding that the, the UK government has has made available, um, both um, sort of historically and some of the earlier projects we did, 
um, to get fuel cells out on the road and demonstrate the capability of that technology at the London Olympics, for example. And more recently, um, supporting our main automotive uh, product development, working with allowing us to work with, you know, both a vehicle manufacturer in, in Chang'an and also a commercial vehicle manufacturer in, 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 or bus manufacturer in terms of Alexander Dennis. Um, and that's, um, that's helping us to set up our production capability. Um, and we're also um, using uh, a funded collaborative approach to work with GK and Aerospace. And this is um, a really key project because it's allowing us to look at the very challenging area of, of aerospace, um, where generally the understanding is developing that the batteries will have a very limited um, capability um, and therefore um, fuel cells look to be the best true zero emission um, way to, uh, to, to deliver flight. And we're very fortunate to be working with the GKN Aerospace on a ATI funded project um, to develop the next generation, very high power density fuel cells. Um, and just wrapping up really, just to say that, you know, we are, um, you know, we're fully aligned with this, this growth approach that we're seeing now um, um, across uh, around the world, but particularly, um, you know, as the markets develop in UK and Europe, um, we're developing from a company that's primarily R&D, um, now manufacturing, um, uh, say, niche volume products to grow to support the requirement for fuel cells for uh, main automotive markets. Um, and this will, um, we, we, we hopefully will be, um, will be in the UK, um, but um, in, in any case, it will be um, our, our key project, uh, key facility for building fuel cells for all, all the applications. Um, and we're very focused on supporting the UK supply chain with a target to achieve over 75% of UK supply chain content. Um, and grow the um, and grow both our own business, but also the supply chain growth uh, to support that as well. So, yep. Um, so, th thanks for that. Just briefly summarising um, how um, how we've you know our, our business approach and the opportunities around fuel cells, and um, you know we're now um, working with customers in all types of markets to offer um, the right zero emission products to support their decarbonisation approach. It's Greg, excellent. I'm really looking forward to that two gigawatt factory, Greg, by the way. Um, so we're very delighted at the APC, um, how much you're doing in the UK. Thank you. Right, we will move on to the next speaker, um, just in the interest of time. So we now, we moved from um, a variety of aspects, but we are now walking into applications. And we are delighted to have David Takre from Teva talk to us, both from a from an experience with knowing where batteries fit in, but also fuel cells. So David, welcome to today's session. Briefly, so um, Dakri, um, Sales and Marketing Director at Teva, um, been with the company now for just over five years, so from the very early days through to the point where we're heading to production. Um, in brief, uh, first things first, it was said earlier, and just to reiterate, total cost of ownership is absolutely everything when it comes to commercial trucks. Um, it's well known that the capex on all forms of electric vehicle is higher than for traditional diesel vehicles. It's also equally well known that the opex is lower. To put some numbers around that, you're looking, if you assume you've got a 10 year lease roughly on an electric vehicle, you've got a capex uplift that translates into an increase in your monthly lease payment of about 500 pounds a month. Offsetting that, you've got a reduction per mile of somewhere between 28 pence and 30 pence per mile. So you do not need to be the world's greatest mathematician to see that TCO parity arrives at around about 1,700 miles a month, which equates to about 80, 90-ish miles on an average day. However, trucks don't tend to do an average day every day. So if you're going to do that as an average day, sometimes you're going to go maybe 150 miles, 250 kilometers. So the, the trick in order to make these vehicles cost effective is to enable high mileage. That is the key to driving rapid electrification. But high mileage, as has been said in some of the earlier presentations, high mileage means a lot of energy. But critically, the question is how much? From the quarter million miles at least that Teva vehicles are now performed in service, what we find is that the amount of energy required to, to perform any given range varies enormously. As per the diagram you can see, 
on the best we've ever recorded, you do 300 kilometers on about 85 kilowatt hours. Worst case, you'll go up to 250 kilowatt hours. Huge, huge range. And effectively, I've just tried to express this in terms of the energy that you always use, the energy that you sometimes use, and the energy you almost never use. And as has been said, if you want to go a long range, you need a lot of energy because you can't ever, not once, not once in a thousand days, can you afford to be run out of energy. So you always have to have enough energy for the very, very worst case. If you're carrying all of that energy as battery, you're carrying an inordinate weight of batteries. And as again was explained earlier, that will impact payload. So you've got this trade-off. You know, batteries are electrically more efficient. They produce the cheapest of energy, but about 11 kilograms per kilowatt hour. Hydrogen which is electrically less efficient. Um, it's about 24 pence a kilowatt hour, rough numbers right now, current costs, but it's only one, maybe between one and three kilograms per kilowatt hour. So one is is cheap, but heavy. The other is lightweight, but more costly. And therefore, our view at Teva is that the smart option is that you carry all your base load energy as battery, because that's, that's the cheap stuff, and they don't need too much of that. And all your contingent energy is hydrogen. And so this whole argument around, oh, is it battery or is it hydrogen? In our view, it's, it's a false argument. We see hydrogen absolutely as the enabler of batteries, the liberator of battery power. Um, and so, again, as I've said here on this slide, you know, these are the figures for a seven and a half ton truck. You would add 50% to all the numbers for, for, for example, an 18 ton truck. So it's a, it's a big wide range and it's about using hydrogen to enable you to manage that large, broad window of range opportunities. So simple, simple summary says range extended trucks carry heavier loads over long distances. However, minimize TCO, we said at the beginning, TCO is absolutely everything, is about matching specification to duty cycle. So three, three very quick examples. So like Warburton's Bakery, you know, they carry vast amounts of fresh air in real terms. So for them, a 12 ton truck is entirely limited by its cubic volume, not by its weight. So for that duty cycle, you can put on a very, very large battery and that'll work fine. Conversely, it's like a supermarket. Um, supermarkets run shortish distances to their own locations. So they can put charging at each location. So they can do 40 miles charge, 40 miles charge, 40 miles charge. With rapid charging, they can have a standard capacity battery, rapid charging, and again, they're absolutely fine, they're good to go. However, you know, the, the bulk of people aren't quite so simple, don't have quite such specific duty cases. We have one particular customer who says they want 300 kilometers of range. They wanna be able to carry two tons and with enough volume for 16 euro pallets and all of that within a seven and a half ton gross vehicle weight. Now, and, and that's a more typical exemplar of most truck operators. And for those, the only option is a range extended electric vehicle. David, we did it, well done. So for everyone joining us, uh, it's, uh, today's the launch of the APC fuel cells value chains and the hydrogen value chains. And um, Luke, the author of that, will take us through that material. Welcome, Luke. Uh, please share your slides. So hi, everyone. I'm Luke Bates, the automotive analyst at the APC. Today, I'll be presenting our new automotive fuel cell system and hydrogen tank value chains. Why did we create these value chains? Well, first of all, a bit of background. We see uh, a demand for fuel cell systems and components um, that is going to ramp up significantly especially from 2025 onwards. And here on this slide, you can actually see that big curve, um, that steep from 2030 and 2035, getting to about 14 gigawatts worth of fuel cell stack demand just in the UK. That's to give you an idea, that's roughly 140,000 um, light duty vehicles. And there will, of course, there will be um, more demand from uh, other applications such as heavy goods vehicles like the Teva trucks. So where are we starting from today in the UK? At the moment, we're manufacturing about 15% of the fuel cell system value add. And, and this is really a strong starting point for the UK that we see um, high potential to get to 65%. Um, and this would not just solve UK uh, 
um, net, net zero aims also be supply into European markets and global markets. If we can scale up membrane electrode assembly, fuel cell stack manufacturing and manufacturing of hydrogen tanks as well that go into those fuel cell systems. So that we really have an opportunity to um, drive that road to net zero for automotive. So let's get ahead of the curve. And here I'll, I'll go through the value chains um, and sort of point out where you might be able to play a role. And we were also happy to hear where you think that you can play a role in these value chains. First of all, the um, a high level view of what's in a fuel cell stack. So you're going from the top left to top right. That's a, a proton exchange membrane into a, a full fuel cell stack that Intelligent Energy makes in the UK. And then below is just some integration of other components. But what's also interesting is realizing what the uh, manufacturing steps between these subcomponents are and whether there are synergies with other industries. So this is our new now launched PEM fuel cell system value chain. It's live on our website. And the, the you can see it's quite detailed value chain all the way from the left-hand side to the right covering the extraction of ores all the way to recycling. Um, and here we, I'd like to point out that um, Johnson Matthew fuel cells in the UK is, is leading in membrane manufacturing, catalyst coated membranes, even membrane electrode assemblies as well. So we're already in a strong position on this value chain. There are interesting synergies as well with other industries, for example, in the gas diffusion layer in carbon paper supply. That is a similar process to paper making. And in, um, in the UK, we have a, a world leading supply of carbon paper and technical fiber products, which is owned by James Cropper. And there are also other synergies with um, the plastic film manufacturing industry, very fine polymer based membrane, and also in membrane electrode assembly, which is similar to food packaging. The other value chain that we decided to um, publish is a more specific one on the hydrogen tank value chain. And here we have decided to cover both type three and type four hydrogen tanks. If you're new to um, hydrogen tank types, that just means a type three is a metallic based liner and a type four is a, a polymer based liner. And then the, the carbon fiber winding on top of that is, is similar for both tanks. The critical thing in the hydrogen tank value chain is the carbon fiber and improving the manufacturing of that to reduce energy intensity and emissions. So we're interested in hearing new processes for manufacturing carbon fiber, but also equally recycling that carbon fiber because there'll be so much um, once the, uh, the tanks reach end of life uh, in these vehicles with the amount that will be demanded in future. So we're happy to um, hear your thoughts on the value chains and where you see opportunities for yourself or other companies and um, yeah, get in touch to find out more. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Right, we have new value chains as well. So we know how to make these things and we know what the value chains look like so we can design the industry or players that can help support that growth. Wonderful, thank you. There are a few questions. We'll try to take as many as we can in the order and then stop in 10 minutes. First question for everybody and, and maybe in particular, um, Joanna and maybe David Hart, given the UK were, are over a year behind Germany and France releasing the hydrogen strategy, where do you think the UK can still provide a competitive edge in the global market for hydrogen technologies? So, you know, the strategy is to some extent an aspiration and a context setting. And, you know, a lot of UK industry, as we've heard very clearly from the speakers, has already been developing capability, developing ramp up strategies um, in order also to be able to be competitive globally, because this is not just about everything produced in the UK for the UK. So I think it's very clear that we have world leading capabilities in fuel cells, in, uh, in R&D, in quite a lot of the engineering supply chain um, that, that we have represented here, in catalyst manufacture, MEA manufacture. So I think there's no, uh, it's, it's really about how industry decides to link with what is offered by the government, but also what is offered more globally in, in terms of their competition. So yeah. I'm, I'm not worried about that. 
Yeah, I think the uh, Chris. Uh, so it's a question from Sean Crispin, and he makes a, a point that says, "Are we too late uh, on where we got on on it, and do we ha still have a chance to catch up?" Maybe is what I think I'm hearing from Sean here. Um, jo Joanna, what's your take on it? <laughs> Sean, it's very nice to hear it from you. You such a hydrogen mm -hmm. enthusiast. Uh, what's your alternative? Do you just give up? Uh, of course, we will catch up. Uh, you know, we we are doing it. We are the paving way with our hydrogen strategy. The industry didn't stop just because the hydrogen strategy document wasn't out. So we have been going. We have been supporting the initiatives. APC's programs has been going on. ATI programs at fuel cells. So we are doing it as an industry. And yes, of course, uh, somebody will be a little bit sooner, a little bit uh, later. But so what? We will all get there. Lovely, Joanna. Um, we'll, we'll, Andy, uh, you have a, a point to bring up and then we'll move on to the next question as well. Yeah, just a, just a quick point building on that. I think the other thing that the UK has got in its favour is the way that we've got the Climate Change Committee and the carbon budgets, because there's those, those carbon budgets which are you know legally binding. We are ahead of the world in doing, in doing a lot of that kind of work. And to David's point earlier, getting the carrots and sticks right is, is a position that JM's pretty good at. So, uh, the, sorry, that the UK is pretty good at. So I think having those carbon budgets to work to and the requirements for hydrogen to meet those carbon budgets is going to be a, a further driver for the UK. Wonderful. So we'll come on to the next question because it'll bring the, the, the other speakers in as well. Um, it's from James Williams. I, um, he's saying, right, we get, we get fuel cells now. Yes, it's a key technology for the UK, but what about manufacturing technology innovations? What will it take to get them out of the lab and into the factories? Yeah, so, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of focus on the um, automation. So I think it's generally understood that the, the, one of the main mechanisms to, um, to get the cost down for fuel cells is going to be increasing levels of automation um, in this fuel cell. I mean, you're, you've got a very, you know, you're building hundreds of cells into a automotive fuel cell system that's highly repeatable um, and controlling the quality and, um, and getting the, uh, the speed of operation up is going to be key um, to that. Um, Secondary, I think, in terms of um, getting to successful products is, is going to be the global demand driving down the, the cost of the supply chain. So, I mean, I think there's lots of uh, figures around um, estimates of that. But again, that's another key element because um, even as a fuel cell manufacturer, we don't make... Um, you know some of the key components that go into the fuel cells and in reality it's, it's better to work with companies like Johnson Matthew who've got that um, global reach and global marketplace who will be you know driving down the, the, the cost of the of the key components as well so it's it's a combination of those elements I'd say in terms of moving from um, very small kind of niche volumes today into a um, competitive product that that can achieve the kind of TCA requirements that um, Tave and others will be looking for going forwards. So uh, yeah, so uh, NPL or Tava, what your 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 comment on from lab to factory? I mean, <clears throat> I might just highlight the importance of metrology, and uh, it's something that we're working at very closely um, with industry on our advanced manufacturing strategy. I think the UK does have a number of strengths in automation and particularly in R&D as well. And one of the things we're trying to do is get quality control techniques from the laboratory onto the pilot line and then into the real world manufacturing scenario. Yeah. Um, and also applying metrology to the instrumentation that's used to the actual machines for the fabrication and using techniques like machine learning and AI as well. So there's a whole lot going on there. And I do think it's a particular strength of the UK. And there are a lot of organizations as well as NPL that can add a lot of value in this space. I think you know, the question, how do you get it from the lab to, to the real world? The reality is that's already happening. You know, for, firstly, that's about investment and, and ensuring that there is a, a favorable environment for investment. You know, this, this is a thing that takes tens, more likely hundreds of millions of dollars to get done on a global scale. So you've got to make it favorable for that investment to come forward. But beyond that, you know, we come back to that old thing, total cost of ownership. You know, you can, you can use this stuff to make total cost of ownership favorable. And, you know, having spent the last five years talking to the biggest fleets in the world, I have just not the faintest shadow of doubt that if we produce the vehicle that does the job, they will buy it. They're crying out for it. 
You know, people like UPS you know, have been bending the ears of people like Daimler and whatever to produce vehicles for a decade by now. And have spent a decade actually driving the industry themselves because they can't get the industry to do it. So if, if there are companies like Tether, not just Tether, but others, others like us, uh, producing those vehicles, be in no doubt that the biggest fleets in the world will lead the charge and they will, they will move faster than the government's legislature. There we go. We heard it from a producer of vehicles. Thank you. Excellent. Um, we'll move on to another question, and this time brings up the question of safety. So the questioner says anonymously uh, that it seems like we haven't talked about safety today uh, as much as we did about cost, uh, roll, roll out of the models. Is safety a limiting or restrictive factor to the development and take up of hydrogen vehicles? Open that to the floor. David Hart. Maybe, maybe say two things which I think are linked. One, we, we haven't mentioned safety because a lot of people have spent a lot of time working on safety. And so there are, there are committees, there are organizations that you will not get a hydrogen vehicle on the road without a lot of people having thought about making it safe. That doesn't mean we can ignore it. It doesn't mean we've, we've solved all the problems, but it's not currently a, a major barrier. It's something that we need to continue improving. The other thing that I think is important to link to that, though, is standardization, because the, 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 the need for safety is part about, partly about doing things right. It's partly about doing things the same way as others. And, and that has a longer knock-on effect, because one of the problems we've faced up until now is costs are high because everybody wants something different. And we have a, a multiplicity of providers and of solutions in the supply chain, and we've, we've already seen from some of those some of those charts that Luke showed. So I think bringing these things together, getting an answer which is good enough that fits the safety criteria that enables rollout of somewhat modularized, somewhat scalable vehicles, all comes together in terms of reducing reducing barriers to, to, to producing large numbers. And I think we, we can't ignore that. Okay, I've got a comment from Andy and then we'll move on to another question. Thanks, Bobby. Yeah, just really building on what David said as an example, the Hyundai Nexo fuel cell vehicle received five star in the in the EU's NCAP rating. So, you know, as David said, this is, this is a big focus, but it, it, it can be done and it is being done. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, um, just echoing the fact that uh, th this is um, massively important. Safety is. It's been tackled by a very important. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of work being put into this, including the HSE is absolutely adamant. There are several public running programs around safety. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, I'll, I'll end with one, one further question. Um, they ask, um, particularly maybe to do with the, uh, the value chains uh, Luke presented is really, can we get to 65% um, value add in the UK? And um, uh, who would like to suggest whether this ambition is realistic or not? I, I can start as to why why it's sixty five percent, but um, it's basically um, if you have MEA manufacturing, which we already do with uh, Johnson Matthey catalyst coated membranes, and yeah. if you do most of that, you already get to about twenty twenty four twenty five percent. Then I think carbon fiber manufacturing that's less energy intensive, more cost effective for hydrogen tanks. That's also a big driver of that value add and getting that carbon fiber right. Um, and then the final one is the stack manufacturing that intelligent energy does or someone else can do and getting that manufacturing at scale with also some bipolar plate manufacturing to do with that. And that gets you to 65%. Those are the three key components. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Um, the way, sorry, just the way that Koreans and, and others like to achieve this is by mandating a certain percentage of made in Korea or made in yeah. China or made in wherever. So there are other ways to get at this, but they're not always the most uh, effective from an optimization of the, of the final product. Um, very good. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, we, uh, we've had a, a good uh, almost an hour and a half on this topic. It's been excellent. I'm just going to bring us to a close in the next few minutes. So firstly, a big, big thank you to all of you uh, speakers, panelists today. Um, I hope um, everyone viewing has enjoyed uh, the webinar session and the quality of debate that we've had on the role of fuel cells in net zero transport. Uh, this is the final of, of APC's webinar series where we've been running this road to COP26. 
the next station is Glasgow, guys. It's Sunday, 31st October, 1st November onwards, a big jam-packed program. Um, what have we learned today? Loads. We see fuel cells as a liberator of uh, battery technologies. We see the uh, fact that there's a dominance internationally in Europe for hydrogen and fuel cells, and UK is, um, is well-placed to take advantage of this with this innovation and R&D. We heard this uh, from NPL. We've heard this from Ricardo. We've got a strong base for fuel cells technology and capability in the UK. There's potential to grow this, and hence the value stream maps and the fuel cell uh, and tank value stream maps play an important role in this. And it comes to this final thing around total cost of ownership, payload being critical factors, use cases we spoke about dwellings where you actually can't get a charge point. So there is a, a diversity of applica uh, applications where the consumer, the infrastructure, the TCO, and then the roadside infrastructure is going to make a big, uh, is going to play a large role in this. And this collaborative approach across all of this will show us how we can decarbonize economies uh, beyond just um, um, relying only on batteries on its own. So I hope you've all enjoyed this um, and thank you very much. This recording uh, will be available for others to also benefit from. So have a good day for, um, for all those and thank you for joining us.